cinema, Red Beerman's videos, Magic Mirror Maze, and Iterations. Beerman's digital appropriation and deformation of Wells's The Lady from Shanghai and Hitchcock's Rear Window will allow me to explore the paradoxical persistence of cinema in the digital age, while also accounting for the qualities that the digital uniquely extracts and intensifies in relation to the cinema. My analysis of these videos will draw a surprising affinity between Leibniz's concept of the fold as the privileged figure of Baroque aesthetics and the algorithmic computational logic of the digital image. This affinity involves two interrelated aspects. First, the fault with its confluence of divergence and convergence, continuity and discontinuity, models the way the digital image entails both an extension of and a radical differentiation from the cinematic. And second, the simultaneity of connectivity and heterogeneity that defines the fault can also function as the paradigmatic model of assemblage or composition of digital images. Oh, this is the other one. It's the other one. Uh, so I'm going to show you the first um, piece that I'm going to, actually the, the paper is more based on the first one, uh, and it's a five minute piece, and I mean, it's five minutes, so it's long for a clip, right? But I want, to sh I want you to see it in its entirety because it's very, very interesting. No? Yeah, just play, thank you. The sound is fine, yeah.
start talking about composition or assemblage in the digital image. When I first saw this piece, what I was immediately struck by was the radical reconfiguration of editing brought about by digital works, and by the way this reconfiguration speaks to the unique virtual and immanent ontology of the digital. In contrast with the binary model of edit editing possibilities in analog cinema, where the shots either embrace an ideal of continuity and perceptual realism or break away from this ideal in favor of creative disjunctions. The impression a digital work like Magic Mirror Maze gives is that it composes or assembles its images imminently, that is, through a self-generative process. This impression is both inaccurate and quite true. Insofar as the logic of digital assemblage is based on algorithmic modulations that are programmed in advance, it is just as externally imposed a model of composition as the editing systems used in analog cinema. Yet, at the same time, once the algorithmic program has been entered, it is left to do its work on and with the images in an entirely automatic and autonomous way. Moreover, in experimental digital works, the algorithmic modulation becomes so exhibitionistic, so ostentatiously exposed, that it subsumes the effect, the effect of the image in its entirety. Algorithmic modulations can infiltrate the image directly and totally, leaving little, if any, room for a mediating presence of referentiality, representation, or ideological meaning. This complete identity of the image and the system that modulates its movement can also account for the ways in which algorithmic editing while involving utterly codified and codifying processes, can extend avant-garde practices and concerns. As a number of scholars have argued, as a model of composition, modulation does not preclude the possibility of unexpected results that exceed the prescriptive appearance of codifying processes. When editing is imminent to the image, rather than functioning in the service of realist representation, or symbolic association, it becomes purely a material basis for sensations. As in avant-garde cinema, this materiality is autopoetic in the sense that it speaks of nothing but itself. It gestures toward no outside, but is instead synonymous with the image as a substance that is extensible and contractible, as pliable as matter. Drawing on Deleuze's comments on art in what is philosophy, one may say that the digital image is like a composed sensory chaos, a materiality that is synonymous with sensation. Detached from any reference, the algorithmic modulation is not about the image, but rather it performs the image. Medium and message, material and sensation coincide. This next section is about uh, extracting the, visual, the virtual folds of Wells's lady from Shanghai. 
Rather than choosing between the polarities of continuity and discontinuity, the digital modulation of images resembles the concept of the fold in its paradoxical simultaneity of continuity and discontinuity. As we watch Magic Mirror Maze literally unfold its folds, we see its chaotic grid of images continuously change and become other, yet the point where the before turns into the after escapes our attention, for in its serially connected, continuously folding universe, the before is always preserved in the after. The principle here, as in the Leibnizian fold, is to produce transitions that will release a maximum of difference within a maximum of continuity. Thus, in contrast with analog cinema, or Lady from Shanghai in this case, the algorithmic logic of the image in Magic Mirror Maze implies an intensification of the virtual that exposes the continual composition and decomposition of bodies and forces, the constant movement of becoming that breaks things away from themselves while insisting on this permanent break as their vital and only sustenance. Bierman's piece reappropriates while also paying homage to Wells's already intensely experimental work, especially the last sequence of the thing. Bierman's piece may be said to come from the opposite side and produce the opposite effects of Hollywood's typical deployment of digital images. While Hollywood tends to convert cinematographic expertise into manipulable algorithmic functions that increase the transparent immediacy of the image, Magic Mirror Maze favors the use of algorithmic functions in the service of highlighting the sensational uncanny already underpinning Wells' famous Hall of Mirrors sequence. Magic Mirror Maze takes up a film sequence that already effectively distorts the comprehensible spatial and temporal parameters of classical editing and splinters these even further. With its chaotic firing of shots among sinister Everett Sloan, femme fatale Rita Hayworth, and doomed lover Orson Welles, the final sequence in Welles' film precludes a distinction between subjects and objects, positions of agency and passivity, while also destroying any sense of spatial center and perspective. Because the mirror no longer occupies a frontal position in relation to the body, but is now an all-enveloping surface, any distinction between the body as physical subject and the body as specular object disappears. We don't see who fires, who gets shot, but rather a series of mirrors being splintered and simultaneously specular images being destroyed. The death belonging to narration is thus equated with a purely cinematic disappearance of the body. Thus, already in Wells' film, materiality trumps representation. This scene's intense perceptual dislocation contains a seed of virtuality. Arguably classical in some respects, Wells' cinematic sequence surprisingly unfolds the body as a series of virtual singularities. And it is this seed of virtuality that Bierman's digital piece zeroes in on and intensifies. Magic Mirror Maze bypasses the epistemological disarray contained in Lady from Shanghai by deploying the algorithm against our very desire for knowledge or intelligibility. A desire for epistemological clarity is preempted and replaced by a chaotic series of compounds of sensations, autonomous percepts and affects that are valid for themselves. In what is philosophy, Deleuze describes percepts and affects as, quote, autonomous and sufficient beings that no longer owe anything to those who have experienced them. The aim of art, he says, is to wrest percept from perceptions of objects and states of, of a perceiving subject, to wrest affect from affections, to extract a pure being of sensations. <clears throat> the conversion from perception to percept from affection or feeling to affect, exactly describes the actions that Magic Mirror Maze undertakes with respect to Wells' cinema. This video performs a displacement from the actual dimension of narrative actions and psychological states of affairs to the virtual plane where these actions and states become a reservoir of pure qualities open to many fold recombining possibilities. 
Despite its computational logic, or maybe because of it, the digital image proves capable of exceeding the code's deterministic path. It acts as such a creative force by opening the original work onto a plane of composition that produces new signals through variations and recombinations. In short, it produces new affects. To trace the deframing work that Magic Mirror Maze undertakes vis-a-vis -vis Lady from Shanghai, it is rather useful to examine the distortion of noir conventions in Biermann's piece and to draw some conclusions as to the aesthetic and political effects of this distortion. Wells's film is set on preserving the femme fatale, for instance, as a centerpiece of its emphatically gendered narrative. In her role as Mrs. Bannister, Hayworth remains a cold, unreadable surface until the very last scene when her mur murderous designs are exposed. This disclosure of the woman's evil nature, however, simultaneously spins a formal chaos that reaches the peak of both narrative disintegration and cinematic creativity. As I have argued in a piece on noir women, the woman's lack of concern for Oedipal law and morality unleashes a destructive force that coincides with narrative inventiveness and aesthetic exuberance. Lacking any representational ties or morally charged significance, Bierman's piece only magnifies the potential for aesthetic exuberance present in Wells's film. Furthermore, it converts the noir assignation of moral blame to the woman into a free-floating affective eeriness evenly distributed amongst all bodies, images, and sounds, rather than simply organized along gender polarities. The modulated distortions that affect the visual track are also vehemently applied to the audio track, bringing out the madness of conversation and further <coughs> diminishing the rationality already compromised in Wells's film. Together, sound and image bring forth an unconscious stream of affects and sensations that underpin not only the noir genre, but an entire architecture of gender codes, fantasies, and projections defining a period of American culture and history. Magic Mirror Maze surpasses the distribution of narrativized emotions along gender lines by abstracting and expanding its affective arc. Thus, the alignment of eroticism and death and the enforced sadistic conflation of woman with this alignment produce affects steeped in culture and history, more impersonal affects, but steeped in culture and history and not merely circumscribed within a fictional context. Therefore, in a paradoxical way, the affective arc in Biermann's piece expands in scope at the same rate as it intensifies its impersonal qualities. So this second piece, I'm just gonna let it play without sound. Um, and I'm just continue, gonna continue, you know, it's like um, not very much, we're very close to the end, but I just want you to see another example while I'm talking and you can. Take the sound out. Oh. Yeah. Is this small one? It, it is that one. Okay. <coughs> it's at the beginning, yeah. Okay. Yeah, no, that's okay. Well, it doesn't matter. Okay, there's, this is a piece that is based on Hitchcock's rear window. So it's really very much about dismantling, but also intensifying voyeurism. Taking up Hitchcock's rear window, oh, it's not playing. It's, it's oh, it is, jeez, yeah. okay. Yeah, 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 it is playing. Thank you. Taking up Hitchcock's rear window, Biermann's iterations cut the frame lengthwise into 18 vertical strips each extracted from different shots within a single scene. Echoing the voyeuristic discourse of the original film, each of these strips functions like a narrow slit that opens onto the world of the original film while intensifying the limits of vision already emphasized in Hitchcock's classic. 
In their verticality and narrow aperture, each panel offers a partially open, partially obstructed view that mingles in simultaneity with the equally open and obstructed views of the adjacent panels. As everyone knows, Hitchcock constructs most of the scenes in rear window on the basis of the point of view shot, alternating between shots of James Stewart looking out his window and shots of the objects of his vision across the courtyard. It is this subject-object structure as the basis for the essentially cinematic operation of voyeurism that iterations destroys while nonetheless augmenting the sensational affects that are produced through a dizzying temporal simultaneity of subject and object. The superimposition of multiple views separated off by minimal degrees of temporal distance creates a constantly folding and unfolding image that collapses the distinction between the voyeur and his object. The success of Hitchcock's film lies in the irony immanent to the voyeur's claim to perceptual mastery, an irony deeply felt in a few scenes where Stuart is asleep while key actions continue to unfold in front of his window. Iterations zeroes in on these scenes of perceptual loss and extends the condition to the spectator. But for the spectator, the loss of perceptual stability results in an excessive multiplication of relations between fragments a frenzy of split images commingling in the unpredictable wave propelled by the algorithm. As in magic, oh, it's stopped, oh no, it's, it's going, there's a weird thing going on in the middle, okay, fine. As in magic mirror maze, this uncanny oneness of images split apart while unfolding together in simultaneity resonates strongly with the structure of the Leibnizian fold. As in the fold, no image here is entirely obscure or distinct. Obscure perceptions and distinct ones are always contained in each other, prefigured by each other, impossible to separate. On the screen of the fold, the labor of seeing becomes exhaustive and exhausting. The objects looked at crowd over the looking subject, wearing out and blinding his consciousness. The final moments of iterations echo this exhaustion. The ripple effect that animates Stuart's body in his voyeuristic frenzy succumbs to a deep wave of sleep. The film ends as it begins, not with one shot, but with many vistas closing by infinitesimal degrees. In place of individual consciousness, revealed as a black hole of sleep and oblivion, Iterations gives us a manifold glimpse into the impersonal, automated consciousness of the cinematic brain. brain. In a digital regime of the visible <coughs> that experiments with the materiality of the image, the political activity of the work can only be understood as immanent to this materiality. Through a continuous activity of self-reconstitution, the digital images in these videos are obsessively engaged in a displacement of forms and in the uncovering of the movement of forces behind those forms. The imminent force of sensations displaces not only the rigid outlines of recognizable forms and their accompanying cliches, but also the transcendental work of judgments and opinions. Without the mediating presence of referentiality or ideological meaning, the aim of the work and the basis for its destabilizing potential is to produce new affects rather than to reproduce the appropriate ethical or emotional responses. With its simultaneous capacity for heterogeneity and connectivity, the model of the fold, as instantiated in these videos, moves away from classical paradigms of knowledge and identity and invites us to imagine unsuspected possibilities and alignments in our relations with the world of others. So I guess that's the end. <laughs> the sound is pretty interesting too, but not as interesting as the other piece. So I'm glad, you know, kind of. But anyways, that's it. Thank you very much.
questions. I thought I was having a question when I was reading it, but I forgot. Do you have a question for yourself? So just one, not many. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.